right, we have we have one final speaker this morning, uh, Mr. Pete Lom from the U.S. Forest Service in Washington D.C. Headquarters office. These two right. Here. You can use these two right here. Laser pointer. Okay. You'll pull up your PowerPoint. Go ahead. Water if you need it, Pete. Uh, what the hell was it? Uh, six. Um, yeah. See if it works. Is the PowerPoint working? Give you a countdown of five, three, and one to fifteen Great. minutes, and leave you some time for questions. And, and if you're running a little long, we'll just reduce the question time. Thanks. There we go. Good morning, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today about another item that is actually pretty significant in terms of especially folks who are in the smoke, in the fire business for their livelihood, for their long careers. Uh, guess what? There are some challenges with the smoke from wildfires in specific and also um, prescribed fire use. So I'm here to talk about it from both a public perspective as well as a fire personnel perspective. Um, we're at the U.S. Forest Service um, and I've uh, been kind of pushing this smoke issue for most of my career, about 25 years now, uh, about the significance of dealing with smoke. Um, and it is really both a message dealing with both the public as well as the fire personnel. A lot of people don't perhaps have an understanding of the risks associated with it um, and the importance of addressing this. And we just heard a talk about stopping and looking at the risk. Well, there's risks associated with smoke one of the thought processes that seems to be very common is the idea that it is one that is only a health-related issue. Well, I'm here to talk about so smoke in the context of its shift to a safety-related issue. So um, key pollutants are real important in this parameter um, that we'll be discussing, particulate matter, and there's different gradations. PM 2.5 is a term used in the United States as well as around the world. There's other size fractions as well. Ozone, carbon monoxide. We're going to, for the public dialogue, talk mostly about particulate matter. For fire personnel, and I want to be very specific, it's just not about fire fighters, but it is also the overhead and the base camps where long-term fire uh, fighting occurs. Um, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and crystalline silica is also another factor that needs to be considered in what we decide to do after the fire actually is uh, busy. Um, so what about the smoke exposure effects of the different pollutants? Um, you know, we were just talking a moment ago about standard firefighting orders. Well, guess what? Um, one of the things that the third line of carbon monoxide diminished mental acuity. So one of your standard fire, uh, uh, you know, orders uh, is making good, clear decisions. Well, if you're cloudy from carbon monoxide exposure, guess what? Are you going to make good decisions? And it's just not on the spur of the moment, but it can be over multiple days if you're trapped in a valley with a lot of smoke without periods of clean air. So this is something that we need to be thinking about. It is a hazard that is not necessarily always addressed and certainly not routinely monitored, um, at least in the United States. I hope there's other places that are more progressive. And of course, we also know carbon monoxide at high levels, and this is certainly an issue that's dealt with probably most predominantly in the structural firefighting world. Uh, it can be fatal at high doses. There's a lot of work that's been done on that side. Particulates, um, respiratory irritation, eye irritation, immune system response. If you uh, hit a lot of particulate matter as a fire personnel and also the public, your immune system is very uh, compromised in terms of any sort of uh, illness that comes in, viruses, etc. And one of the things that actually was starting to pop up in the last couple of years in the United States is particulate matter in valleys, which just happens to be some of the places where we put our firefighters to be bed down for the night, um, can have very high doses of smoke and particulate matter, and guess what? Inadequate rest, you wake up every hour because of the smoke, your rest and recovery, the next day you're fatigued, do that multiple days, and all of a sudden your decision and your physical capacity starts to decline in a fairly significant way. Some of these seem to me to be pointing at potential safety risks, not a health effect, but literally operational safety challenges. So let's talk about it a little bit further. Health and safety effects. 
Everyone responds to different pollutants differently, unfortunately. We have some characteristics that, um, like the respiratory challenges I mentioned a moment ago. But basically, the combination of pollutants is also important. And the more different types of pollutants that you have, the more significant the reaction. It's not an additive response, unfortunately. It's one that's exponential, according to the um, occupational safety folks. Dose concentration versus ventilation rate versus time. Obviously, the public can change their re and reduce their exposure fairly easily. I'll talk about that. But fire personnel, it's kind of part of the workplace environment. But the reality is, is there can be some responses in that arena as well. So let's talk about the public context. In the United States, uh, and I'll use this as an example, but there are vulnerable groups. And um, certainly groups such as those with asthma, uh, cardiopulmonary disease, pneumonia, lung cancer, heart disease, they exist in all populations around the world. These groups are very sensitive to smoke impacts. In fact, to the degree that it can threaten their lives. Again, I take a look, and I'll, I'll point this out in the next slide, when you start shifting into threatening life, that seems to me to be a safety threat. That's no longer a health issue. Um, sensitive groups, um, older adults, um, we found in the United States those with low income, um, and then the science is also indicating that there are effects from smoke on pregnant women, and also some fairly adverse effects with those with diabetes. So. I know that most populations around the world, we have this presence out there and being affected by smoke. Um, we also in the United States have found fairly high success that when we warn folks about smoke and you actually start to think about the smoke effects, the public does respond. Um, and there's some opportunities here with that learning. Um, particulate matter. Uh, unfortunately, the medical science that we've been looking at in the United States is indicating that virtually no particulate matter is healthy. It will have a deleterious effect over time. Um, ozone, another, uh, another pollutant, um, again, down to fairly significant levels, very good at triggering asthma effects. And if you're around an urban area where you're also adding smoke into the mix, you're going to potentially increase ozone, another issue. Um, we've looked at some medical costs. Eight per $80 per day per person exposure to wildfire smoke, that's a fairly large number. If you think about some of the large wildfire seasons in the United States, multiply the millions of people that had exposure to smoke, times some of those numbers, um, actually you start to get to the point of challenging the suppression costs of some of these fires by fairly significant margins. Um, worldwide, um, we have a fair number of um, uh, estimated premature mortality from biomass burning. Uh, a lot of this is wildfire. Um, I'll point this out in the next slide. Most of this is focused down in South America, Africa, and uh, certainly Southeast Asia with very high levels of, of smoke that we've all watched on the news or experienced. And so this is another uh, factor that, that we need to be thinking about. Uh, it can lead to substantial numbers. 180,000 people a year is not um, a small number. And the United States, uh, and, and coming from the U.S., uh, not small. Uh, Europe, luckily, is fairly uh, low on this list, but not uh, immune also from premature mortality from biomass burning. Um, in the United States, we have an obligation that we pass from our federal government down to our state government to respond to the smoke, and it's, it drives some of the concerns around the public. Um, and then there's a small little statement here at the bottom, and that is those who are fighting the fire, um, the land managers who are engaged in these wildfires, well, guess what? They're the ones who know about the source of the pollution most um, directly. So let's talk about that transition from health to safety, because it's awfully critical in this dialogue. And it's one thing to have a little bit of eye tearing and perhaps even a little bit of difficulty breathing um, and some coughing, uh, which may be reflective of some impaired lung function. And that's actually a fairly common response to smoke. You get it around your campfire. But if you start moving into the idea of a mother with a child who has asthma, sitting there in, an, in, a, in a town that's being impacted by smoke with fire equipment, rushing to a hospital in a rural area that may or may not have air handling equipment to deal with the situation, or multiple parents with kids uh, fighting this situation where the asthma attack is now having the kid turn blue. I don't know. As a parent, I think I would be very concerned about the safety issue that's associated with that. And that's a transition to safety. It's no longer a health impact at that particular moment. 
we start getting to an emergency room and uh, having to deal with that, whether it's public or um, fire personnel, this becomes a significant issue in terms of safety. And so that's the transition that I'm spending some time working on. The good news is that that frequency of the, of the movement to the safety risk is less common than, say, the health, overall health effects. On the fire personnel side, most of our work has been focused on firefighters. And um, we've got a number of years of, of work that was done certainly in the 80s um, and in the, also back even into the 70s. It's been a question about what are the effects of smoke. So um, most of the information has, at that time was inconclusive. Um, and there's some challenges uh, because there are some cultural expectations that if we start learning about smoke, it's going to change how all operations occur. It may change the shift duration. It may change our ability to pay for these operations. We may have to double resources. You name it. There's lots of people. There's lots of concerns when you take it into an operational setting in responding to wildfire. But let me look at the fires of Yellowstone in 1988 when we had, I think it was about a two-month long period, maybe almost three-month long period with a lot of wildfire and a lot of smoke, 30,000 medical visits. And this is of the fire personnel. This is not the public that's captured here. 12,000 with respiratory complaints, 600 required subsequent medical attention. Um, that's a substantial impact. A lot of smoke, a lot of fuels going up, long duration exposure. I spent 36 years, uh, 36 days there working helicopters, so I do have some experience with some of that smoke. Um, unfortunately, the response was not so great in the United States. From 1990 to about 2015, 2012, we didn't really study very much smoke impact on firefighters. So here we had that great 1998 experience. We had some proposed studies in the early 90s responding to this, and People kind of wanted to shove it under the, under the table. They, they did not want to address the issue. Um, that's kind of changed. There's been some new work. Um, and so the good news is that there is some effort that's undergoing, you know, that's happening. Um, but there's also another challenge that comes in is, you know, who's trained in addressing the smoke risk on the fire team? Is the safety officer ready to deal with smoke and exposure and talking about those symptoms and then what, what to do if symptoms from CO exposure start popping up or the fatigue issues arise? Who is there? Is it the medical unit leader? What position? Is it a personal responsibility if you're starting to feel the effects? Do you, do you stop, talk, and, and, and take that message? And, and what do you do? Um, there's some pretty serious questions there. So um, there are some occupational standards that have been set in the United States, but the bad news is almost all of these are oriented towards um, working in a factory, that kind of exposure. There are a couple that have been put out as guidelines by the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, which try to get into the longer shifts that are experienced by fire personnel, but um, they're guidelines. Unfortunately, uh, the recent findings indicate that there are exceedances of just about every one of those standards that I just showed you. Not, ha many frequent, not a high frequency, but anywhere from 1% to 10% exceedances in your average fire personnel um, that are out on the fire line. That's a fairly significant statement. It means we have some work to do, some mitigation to potentially look at. Um, base camps have been studied, but not so heavily. Um, and there are some uh, concerns there as well. So um, the key thing here uh, to look at is modifying that dose, um, and that's uh, one of the key things as well. Fireline personnel, typically healthy and, and more fit, uh, are able to withstand higher levels of CO and certainly higher levels of particulate matter. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, a lot of our overhead are older folks that are less able to put, take this kind of exposure. So the base camps and that kind of exposure when we get smoke down there actually have some potential for greater impact. Um, and the same thing with uh, contract personnel that may or may not be medically screened to be able to deal with this. And we also have a cultural issue. Do you want to show a weakness perhaps that you're having a difficulty breathing? Most folks I know, and I was a former hotshot, hell no. I'm going to keep fighting fire. I mean, I'm here to make money. I'm going to move. I'm going to do the job. Well, the reality is that's probably not the best response. There are some tools out there. I've put some links that are important. Um, unfortunately, uh, it is only in English at this point, but we have a video that talks about some of these hazards, and um, these are important things to consider, uh, places to go for more information. 
The good news is that some of the teams out there are starting to look at smoke as a specific risk. And one of our risk analysis um, hazard uh, tools, uh, the 215B, is uh, something that is starting to show up with smoke uh, miraculously. And there's starting to start be some mitigation that's being thought about. So let's talk about public um, as well. Uh, the good news here is we can usually get a message to the public a little bit easier sometimes, and there's probably not the cultural bias that we have on firefighters, um, but we do need to uh, pay attention to symptoms, and we can get messages out there which we understand the public will respond effectively. Um, and so there are significant effects, as pointed out at the bottom of this, that, you know, mortality is increased when you expose folks to significant levels of smoke for significant durations. So some of the messages, pretty simple, stay indoors, although I will point out that a lot of the work lately is indicating that staying indoors and trying to close windows, et cetera, they better have good windows, they better have a good circulation system, or else you're almost in the same hazardous smoke levels as you are outside. And that's a, a, a bad news piece because we've been telling people stay inside, stay out of the air. If it's hazardous levels especially, it's likely going to be really high levels inside the house or inside the structure as well, um, one of the issues. Communities can be advised to cancel events, and uh, there have been advice like that. Um, only a few times in the United States has there been evacuation of a community because of smoke. Canada tends to lead the way um, that I've found in terms of nations pulling the plug and saying time to get folks out uh, because of the inadequacy of medical systems to be able to deal with smoke uh, impacts on the public. In the United States, we are trying to address this progressively. Um, we have a significant wildfire issue, 7 million acres a year. Um, we have 12, 12 million acres a year of prescribed burning. Thank goodness those are at levels that are much more managed and timed to minimize effects. Um, but I want to point out for wildfire in the United States, that is the largest source of high levels of particulate matter that we've got. In fact, Right now, compared with our industrial sources and mobile sources and all the other sources for particulate matter, wildfire, prescribed fire combined probably make up about 40 to 50 percent of the particulate matter load in the United States. And if you think about the spikes of those numbers, all of a sudden fire is going to become very much a focal point in this pollution issue. Um, we impact millions. Um, it is challenging in the rural areas because of, of the fact that we have many more folks that are involved um, that, uh, out there that are in the sensitive groups. Um, and, um, you know, it's, we're starting to also realize, looking at risks, and it's been a dialogue through the day of looking at risk, looking at these hazardous in the response to incident management teams and agency administrators, uh, and that is air is now starting to be thought about in the smoke impacts. So we have a wildland fire air quality response program, which I lead in the United States. We started back in 2011. Um, we look at three key things, public health, transportation safety, and fire personnel exposure. I want to take one moment and pause here to talk about transportation safety. We've had um, a number of incidents in the United States with smoke on transportation corridors, combining with high humidity and other key uh, meteorological parameters, where you literally cannot see from me to the gentleman in the front row with the density of smoke. Hit that at 100 kilometers an hour, and let me tell you, your driving is very challenged, and as a result, we wind up with fatalities. Um, we had one attributed potentially contributory um, from a prescribed fire this year, and I've been hearing stories about a couple in the wildfires in the southeast, which I need to look into further. But this is, over many, the last 25, 30 years, this is one where I would say a direct threat to both personnel and the public exists that needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in a more serious fashion. We've had first responders run over in this kind of smoke condition. We've had first responders trying to prevent the public from driving into these areas killed, and we have also had the public killed that when they drive into these uh, super fog areas, these areas of total whiteout conditions, they literally, I mean, they, you can't see. Um, so we're trying to put together a system in, uh, that can address some of these transportation safety risks. We use modeling, monitoring, and communication, uh, as well as the active response, and then we try to tie in with a lot of our other agency uh, cooperators. So the modeling is based on what's known as the blue sky modeling framework. 
And um, so that uh, is an issue. Uh, it does take fine resolution and um, grid scales down to one kilometer domains, which really help the performance of our modeling. Um, and here's a picture of a King fire, which actually resulted in the cancellation of an international triathlon event uh, a couple of years ago because of the density of smoke. They were predicting hazardous conditions. People traveled around the world to this area. Um, in that competition, no way that they could do it. Folks that went out later chose to do working out, you know, do a bike run and everything else. Anecdotally, they wound up all getting sick. We have a cache of particulate matter monitors that we have for emergency deployment in order to get to the communities as well as base camps. Yep, I got that message, Tom. I'm almost done. And then we have communication tools as well, where we put out forecasts and outlooks to the different uh, communities um, that are going to be affected by smoke, what the density and level of the effect is, um, and we're really trying to refine that communication tool uh, and also work with the local areas uh, to get the message out to the public in specific. And then we also have, right on the incident management teams, we are um, increasingly deploying technical specialists called air resource advisors. These folks go out on the fire, they work on the team, so they understand the fire behavior, they understand the burnout operations, they understand the fuels, they understand the conditions in terms of consumption, all which affect the source strength, and then that's modeled to look at where the smoke's going to go, is it going to be an issue? They're there to try and provide some input into the fire line personnel challenges, but definitely there to address transportation impacts and the public impacts as well. Stop there. One question. Uh, hi there, Peter. Um, uh, just curious, um, are there any longitudinal studies uh, with regards to chronic uh, consequences of um, long-term exposure to smoke in the wildland uh, arena? The long-term studies are lagging far behind the just the short-term effect folks uh, in the studies there. Um, they are finding some hardening of the arteries, mostly attuned to structural firefighting, but there has been some implications for fire personnel in the wildland line of work as well. But the, it's not nearly, it's preliminary at best. Thank you, everyone.